Welcome back to the Van Diemen Formula Ford restoration. And on the last episode, we got the engine stripped down. Hopefully on this episode, we're gonna get the Ford 1600 Kent engine back into one piece. When I originally pulled this engine apart, I think I missed something really quite obvious and quite important. We've got a standard crankshaft that doesn't really belong in this engine and a discolored conrod. When we pulled the dry sump tank out in one of the previous episodes, it had a bunch of shrapnel in it. So this thing's obviously turned to bearing at some stage, really hurt the conrod quite bad and obviously destroyed the crankshaft. This crankshaft is straight out of a road car. It hasn't been balanced or lightened and really doesn't belong in this engine at all. And that certainly makes more sense why this thing's such a, such a bits and pieces kind of engine. It's, it's just been patched up just to get it running again. Since we've stripped this thing down in the last episode, there's been a lot of cleaning and inspecting. It's not the most glamorous part of an engine build, but it's probably the most important. We need to get on top of any issues now before we put it back together. First thing we did with the block is run the stones through the bores so we could measure the bores and see what sort of condition they were in. And the first thing we noticed was there was a massive step at the top of each cylinder. And this is why it was so difficult to get the pistons out when we stripped this thing down. The bores were in really bad shape. They were out around and no longer square to the crankshaft tunnel. The crankshaft tunnel we know we needed to machine because of the wear marks and the bearings. We checked that, was nowhere near straight. So we honed line board the, uh, the crank tunnel. Then the deck surface wasn't parallel to the crankshaft. So we needed to re-square that. And then the liners were that bad the balls were that out around with that we could not machine them far enough to get them back into where they should have been. The walls of the cylinders would have been too thin and it would have presented us problems further down the track. So the block now has four new liners. It's been decked. The main tunnel has been machined. It's been chemically cleaned to strip off the hundred layers of paint that was on it. It's been probably cleaned another six times since then after each machining process, it gets recleaned. Nobody wants to put a dirty engine in their very expensive machines. So this thing should be thoroughly cleaned. Well, next thing we need to do is just that final inspection, just to make sure there's no casting flash that may cause us any issues. And also make sure that the oil galleries are absolutely spotless. Now that the block is clean, we've already deburred the bottom of the liners to make sure no burrs catch the pistons when they travel all the way down on the bottom of the stroke. We need to get rid of the casting flash. The casting flash, as you can see, is that large rib in the casting. Now this won't cause the engine to blow up, but if that casting or a piece of that casting should break off, it's gonna go straight through that oil pump and cause a whole lot of damage. And that might cause the engine to blow up. We simply touch them up with the die grinder. We take any high spots off or anything we think will cause an issue. We deburr everything we need to deburr, and then this thing should be ready for its final clean and then paint. Unfortunately, the cylinder head that came with the engine is basically unusable for what we need. It's, the ports are way too big for this engine. This is a 1.6 liter engine with essentially a standard camshaft that doesn't spin real hard. You would need to do 8,000 revs to, to, for the cylinder head to work. The ports are that big, we're really gonna struggle for airflow. So we've found one of our old cylinder heads that we've actually raced with. It's, um, it's was a, quite a competitive head, but we came up with a better one. That's why it got replaced and that's why it's been in storage for so long. Best part about that, we also have the matching intake manifold for it that's been port matched, everything's to the rules. It's got all the right gear in it. We've just stripped it down to give it a clean. We'll get this remachined, double checked, and we'll paint this while we paint the block. Now, before we get too involved in this engine build, understand one thing. I am not the world's best engine builder. We've been fortunate enough to employ some really great engine builders over the time, and I've learned a lot, but I am not the world's best engine builder. If you've got any tips, suggestions, or you think I'm doing something wrong, please smash the comments below. That way we can all learn from it. Hopefully I can teach you guys something, but if you can teach me something as well, even better. I am not the world's best engine builder, but I do enjoy building an engine. The casting flash has been ground up inside this block. This one 
wasn't too bad. I only had a couple of spots that needed to be ground down. Some blocks are absolutely terrible and you can spend hours grinding these up. Now that that's done, we're ready for masking and paint. I like to paint the pieces individually. I think it gives it a little bit more detail when it goes back together. Some guys prefer to paint it all assembled. Uh, it's good insurance, it's, um, it's certainly a good sealant, but I prefer the detail when it goes together so you can see the gaskets and all the individual pieces. Masking up the, the cylinder head and the block doesn't need to be any harder than it has to be. You know, there's, there's gotta be shortcuts and there's gotta be easy ways to do it. So all I do is lay the masking tape on, really rough, and then get my file and just file the edges. So this not only cuts the tape exactly to the right shape, also takes the burr off where it's been machined and gives a really neat finish. As easy as that. Quick and easy and really sharp, clean lines. There you go, as easy as that. A couple of minutes, this thing's taped up, ready to go. The cylinder head's about to come back from machining. We can mask it up, get these painted at the same time. Now, for those of you that watched the last video, I was pretty critical on the last guy for painting the spark plug threads. You need to earth your spark plugs to get them to spark. And I struggled to get them out, there was that much paint in there. And you're certainly not gonna get a good earth on your spark plug with 100 coats of paint inside the threads. Take the time to mask it up, it's well worth the effort. It gives you a much nicer finish. Once this is painted, we'll tap out any threads we need to make sure we don't have any problems getting bolts in and out and make sure those threads aren't clogged up with a heap of paint. And the block and the cylinder head have just come back from paint and they look absolutely sensational. This is actually the exact color code we used some 20 years ago to make this restoration as period correct as we possibly can. All, all the machining's done. We've got all the new parts we think we need. So that can only mean one thing we can actually put this engine back together. The absolute first thing we're gonna do is check the main bearing clearances. Our jobs as engine builders becomes all about checking everybody else's work. It's all good just to bolt something together because the machine shop said it was okay, but it's our names on the job from here on in. So we need to make sure that this thing is exactly how we need it. I've got the new bearings to match the crankshaft. The crankshaft's a whole other story, I'll get to that in a second. When you put the shells in, roll them in gently, make sure the oil galleries line up and they sit flush at each end. Now, what I did notice when we pulled the other engine apart was somebody's really got to the bearing shells with like a scour pad or a bit of sandpaper and really peeled off the uh, a couple of layers of the coating. And, and I wanna ask you guys, is this, is this still a thing? Is this still something that, that people do? I'm aware that people used to do that way back when, but I, I don't know if it's still still common practice. It's not something I do, but I might be wrong. You, you might be able to tell me something that I don't know and give me the reason why they do it, really. Um, I put the bearings in dry. You don't want them to float around on the journals. You want them to lock in as best as possible. Don't put Loctite on the back of the bearing. I've seen that done before. It really affects how the bearing transfers the heat um, and it's not sitting in there right. It's got, a, it's got a film behind it. It'll push the bearing out of shape. Main caps, tidied up, deburred, all look nice and sweet. And obviously you're still visually inspecting as you're putting it together to make sure there's no dust or dirt in there or, or something's not quite right. I'll go through now, I'll get these caps on, I'll get them all torqued up, and then we'll just use a snap gauge and a micrometer just to make sure that they're round they're where they should be, and we can measure the crankshaft to establish our true bearing clearance. Now that I've got all the caps on, in order, in the right place, arrows pointing forwards, 
I can use my snap gauge just to double check that they are round and that effectively they're all the same size. I don't want any steps in the bearings, which might mean I've got the caps mixed up or maybe the machine shops had them fitted incorrectly when they've lined board the tunnel. They all feel really good. And just finding that sweet spot, it's, it's probably all about the feeling. Oh, I'm, I'm a little bit old school, I guess. I prefer the snap gauge over the internal mic, just because you can get that feel a little bit better than watching a dial move around. I think we've got that where it needs to be. Now what we can do is we can measure that. That'll tell us exactly um, the size of the, in, uh, the internal of the bearing. which we've got there. And now the easy part of it, I can just go over here to the crankshaft, measure the crankshaft, and it'll tell me exactly what I've got. If I've got any discrepancies between what would have been the internal mic and the external mic, that, that's now void. It's now, I'm, I'm measuring everything with the same bit of gear, so that will tell me exactly what I've got. Now measuring the journal, same, it's all about feel. It's just finding that sweet spot where it's just contacts, but you're not recalibrating the the, uh, the micrometers when you're in there. Let's go through, check all the journals, check them in a couple of places. Now, you've probably noticed that this isn't the crankshaft the engine uh, originally came with. That crankshaft is no good. It's got a twist in it that we would unlikely be able to machine out. It's, it's pretty sad indeed. This crank's been blueprinted, right? So it's basically put everything back where it should be just to a, a, a closer specification than factories used. So all the piston events are at the same period, same stroke on each cylinder, the main journals are straight, but all the, uh, all the, the rod journals are same, they're all straight. There's, there's no ones getting to TDC before the other piston. We want everything to happen at the same time. Blueprinted, down to minimum weight. And I can tell you exactly what our bearing clearances are. Two and a quarter thou. So for a road car, that's super loose. But for a race engine, probably still a little bit on the loose side, but it's, um, it's, it's certainly within the window. We need that extra little bit of clearance because it will run hotter than a road car will. It's doing more RPM. We want more bearing clearance to get more air, um, oil flow through the journal to keep it all cooler. This is spot on and we can now fit this to the engine. With those main caps removed, it's time for the last visual inspection before components start to be fitted. Grab the airline, blow it out, make sure this thing is absolutely spotless. Get rid of any contamination that we could have even ingested just during that dummy assembly. Make sure the crankshaft's clean so the crankshaft can go in there. But while you're blowing your oil galleries and everything out, make sure your compressor air is filtered. Um, I've seen it before where guys have got compressors that are spewing out oil or water and they'll blow out an engine and probably pump more stuff in there that was, than was in there originally. So just make sure your compressor's in good condition, put a filter on it if you need to. But this is the time to make sure that this thing is spotless and we're gonna start fitting components. Now that I'm happy that everything is clean, we're ready to fit the crankshaft and I'm gonna use assembly lube on the bearings, but I'd really like to hear what, what you guys are up to. We, we hear a lot of stories about people having magic mixes of, of special oils or, or lithium greases or all sorts of stuff really. So um, I've, I've used assembly lube forever. And the majority of the reason for that is often we'll build an engine that'll sit for months and months before it's even fitted to the car, let alone started. So something that can hang around in the bearing, give that, uh, give that protection on initial startup as well as um, prevent corrosion has, has been sort of the priority and the reason why I've, I've, I've used assembly lube for so long. KCK Lubricants doesn't make an assembly lube. The, the reason for that is there's so many good products on the market that we can't make something better. We're no good making the same as everybody else. If we can't make it better than anybody else, 
we're not even going to bother. We won't even go there. A good smear of assembly lube on. I want to cover the full surface of the bearing. These are a grooved bearing. They're all got some assembly lube on them now. We're right to drop the crankshaft in. This has been cleaned heaps. Um, and you can see it's, it's a really nice finish. It's not quite polished. We're not allowed to polish the crankshafts, but we certainly can correct the surface finish. And that's all that's been done there is a, a thorough deburring. Now that crank's sitting in there, we can put the thrust bearings in. A little bit of assembly lube on the thrust face of that, not on the backside, but on the bit that actually touches the crankshaft. We'll gently feed that in there. That sits in a groove in the center bearing cap. We'll check end float when it's together, but we sort of don't have too much adjustment on that. It, it really is what it is. As long as it's not way out of specification, it's, uh, it's not really something to worry about. And the only reason we put assembly lube on the thrust bearings is generally on initial startup, you'll have your foot on the clutch, pushes the crankshaft forward and puts a lot of load on these, on these thrust bearings. Get that one in there. And then they're held in by that center bearing cap. I'll go ahead now, lube up those top caps, get the cap sitting in there, and then we can measure the end float and keep moving forwards. One of the other things we do with the main caps is we actually torque them down a little bit higher than the factory spec. The, the bolts are good enough for it, but if you're going to do this, you need to tell your machine shop because it actually pulls the caps out of shape. It stops the caps floating around, which we've seen when we use the factory torque spec, but you need to get the tunnel align board at the higher torque spec because it does, it distorts the bottom of the, the, bottom of the block and the, the caps go out around stops the caps floating around, prevents engine failures, but it is a machine process. It is, a, is, it is an added expense, really. Crankshaft's in, torque down. I've got the dial indicator on the end of the crank. I've just put the bolt in, so I've got something flat to, to measure it on. Now, all I have to do is just push that counterweight forwards and backwards. And you can probably hear it. Just that little bit of end float in the crankshaft. It's maybe four and three quarters thou, so actually on the tight side of a standard specification, which is fine, it's, it's not a real concern. But the other thing is rotate that crank by hand, make sure it's smooth and free. It's a little bit uh, gummier than normal because of the assembly lube. If I'd used oil, it would have been free, but it's certainly very smooth. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to turn it. And that's what we're looking for. That's why we've gone to all this effort. This crank rotates really, really nicely. It's, it's smooth. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to get it to start to turn. It feels exactly how it should. And even when you slide it backwards and forwards to get the end float, it's very, very smooth to move in the bearings. That should indicate that everything's okay. A little trick, I've got an engine turning tool that I last used 20 years ago when I, when I used to build these engines. It makes life really easy to turn them over. Just slide it on the end there and I've got something to grab hold of. Next thing we'll do while the engine's upside down is lifters and camshaft, and then we're onto pistons and rods. Quite a simple engine, but we just wanna make sure everything's okay. I'll finish the prep on the lifters, get them cleaned up, and then we'll get them in the block. Just before we move away from the crankshaft, another really important factor is the flywheel that bolts the crankshaft. This crankshaft needs to be a minimum weight so does the flywheel. So we need to have these as a match set. This is the crankshaft that was supplied with the engine, with the car. 
It's a full weight crankshaft, never been balanced, has had nothing done to it at all. And this is the flywheel that was supplied with that crankshaft. Other than being rusty and disgusting, you can see on the backside in particular, that shoulder's really big and that hasn't been machined at all. It's full weight. We're allowed to take quite a bit of weight off the flywheels and this helps with not only acceleration, but really helps out the gearbox with gear changes and, and really sharpens them up. The shoulder on that back edge is much thinner and it's had a lot of machining done here. This has had a lot of weight removed. It's also been nicely surfaced for the clutch. It's not all rusty and gross like the other one, but this is now matched to that crankshaft. They've been balanced together. We want this thing as smooth as possible. We don't want anything interrupting the inertia of the engine. Balancing these is really critical. The next thing to go on the block is the flat tap at lifters. Your grandfather might have told him about them. I think they're cool. These only go in one way, you can't mess them up, but heaps of assembly lube is certainly, certainly the go. I use a magnet to drop them in there. They're, they're quite a way down the, uh, down the block. You shouldn't drop engine parts and it is quite embarrassing when people see you do it. So just a magnet on a stick, lower them down on the bore, make sure they're smooth, make sure they drop in there nice. If there's anything wrong or if you have to hit them in with a hammer, probably pull them out and just, just double check them make sure that everything's okay. For those of you who watched the video on the engine disassembly, would have heard my story about the flat tappets and which ones not to use. I actually found that actual engine in the other shop. Now, before you laugh about me collecting engines for 20 years, we use a lot of this stuff for research and development. It's, it's stuff we don't really want other people to know about. So it is secret and we, and we do protect our, in, uh, our intellectual property. Um, this engine was still essentially complete. It had a development sump on it that, that we're using on the dyno. And it, as you can see from this, it did quite a lot of damage. There's still half a camshaft jammed in the block, big hole on the side of it. And it uh, just about destroyed everything in there. But don't use factory forward lifters, they do fail. They don't like the RPMs. The heads fall off and whether that's from valve float and they hit the hit the block and peel the heads off, I don't, don't really know. I never got around to figuring that one out. But yeah, aftermarket ones are definitely the ticket. Another thing we do, just while I put the rest of these lifters in, for those of you who watched the engine disassembly video also would have noticed there was no dowel in the camshaft. This is crying out for problems. You need something to locate that cam gear. The bolts won't do, the bolts will keep coming loose or it will shear the bolts off. So we've had the front of the camshaft machined. The dowel we put in is a stepped dowel as I covered in that video and it screws in so it can't come out. There's also a retaining plate that goes over the front that holds it all together. I've got my hands on a retaining plate so it should all be back to how it should be. All the lifters are in, dowels in the end of the camshaft. Camshaft's nice and clean, it's a, a Ford part number cam. It's the cam we have to use. That crankshaft also is a Ford part number crankshaft. We can use a scat crank, but it has to be a little bit heavier, so there's no, to make sure there's no advantage in, uh, in replacing it really to keep the cost as low as possible. Heaps of assembly lube on the cam lobes on the bearings. Hopefully this thing slides in there as it should. It's not a bad trick to have, have like a long handle on the front, sometimes a threaded rod with a bit of bar on it just to help guide it in. But I think I should be able to get my hand down next to the crankshaft to line this up. Almost done getting the assembly lube on. Obviously quite a messy job without gloves on. This makes it a little bit nicer. Flat tappets are hugely critical on, on their initial startup, on how you run them in and how they bed to, the, uh, bed to the camshaft. You can't use old flat tappets on a new cam. You can use new flat tappets on an old cam. So just keep that in mind. It'll, uh, it'll eat the cam really, really quick. Um, and if you go back to the cam manufacturer, they'll probably laugh at you and tell you, that you did it the wrong way. 
Okay, hopefully this will fit in there the way it should. You wanna be really careful that the bearings are quite soft. You can't go bouncing the camshaft around over the bearings. You'll rip big holes in them. We're about halfway through the block now. I can just get down there and support the cam with the uh, with my other hand. Just about in. And that's nice. Turns really nice, there's no resistance pushing it through. I didn't need to hit it with a hammer. I can now put the, uh, the camshaft retaining plate on it. Might even put the, uh, put the cam gears and the chain on, just so essentially the bottom end of the engine's finished, we can roll it over, get the pistons sorted and get them in there. Camshaft thrust plate has been installed as well as the timing gears. The gears themselves only go one way. The easiest way to identify that is timing marks to the front of the engine so you can see them. The crank gear has a really large chamfer on the inside that goes against the shoulder on the crankshaft. They only go one way. Lots of thread locker, thread lock everything on the front of these. It'll fall apart otherwise. Because of the high RPM, the harmonics, the vibration, the heat stress and everything else, it's better to be safe than sorry. The proper cam locking plates on, it actually locks the bolts in as well. So you don't need to put the wrong size washers on there. It's a really handy bit of gear. This will also stop the factory dowel from falling out the front of the engine. Really critical. But now that's together, it turns over super smooth. Really, really nice. No funny grinding sounds, no swarf falling out the bottom. Really smooth. We've, we're just about ready to turn this thing over and get on the pistons and rods. I have laid out on the bench our freshly machined con rods. All the big ends had to be resized. One of the con rods actually had a bend in it, um, needed to be replaced. Resized, not only that, they've been balanced. All the little ends weigh the same, all the big ends weigh the same, and all the overall weights are the same. This is so our rotating mass will remain in balance but the weight the crankshaft needs to accelerate and stop will be the same for each journal, also helping with the balance. There are, they are all exactly the same length, unlike before, and are straight. That journal is parallel to that journal, pretty straightforward. They've been thoroughly inspected. Um, there's no cracks, stretching, bending, or anything like that, so these are now ready to be used. Pistons, brand new pistons. The old pistons are absolutely cactus. They shouldn't have gone in the engine originally. These have been weighed. Fun fact, out of the box, these were all within one gram of each other. We've taken them down to minimum weight because we can. They give us, give us the minimum weight and we're gonna exploit that all we can. These have been sized to each individual cylinder. Piston to, piston to uh, cylinder clearance is, a, is around about 3 thousandths of an inch which same is probably a little bit loose for a race car, but for, for a little bit loose for a road car, but for a race car, it's certainly somewhere near the money. We can now assemble the pistons to the con rods. It's not that difficult a process. They've been nice enough to put an F on the con rods for us. F to the front, there's an arrow on the pistons, so we know which way those go. When using the circlips, only compress the circlips as much as you need to. Don't compress them anymore, they'll lose their spring and they'll be more likely to fall out. I'm gonna go through now that these are cleaned up, assemble the pistons to the rods, and then we can double check our bearing clearance before we fit these to the engine. If you pay particular attention to the circlips when you put them in, you'll notice there's a sharp side and a rounded side, and this is from how the circlips have been stamped when they're manufactured. I always put the sharp side out so it locks into that groove a little bit better. I, I'm worried that if I put it chamfered side out, it's more likely to pop out of the groove. The other thing I do is put the tabs directly down. I don't put them on the side because I'm worried with the piston going up and down, it might give that circlip an opportunity to come loose. If anybody else has any tips or tricks with the circlips, I'd love to hear it. If I'm doing it wrong, please tell me. Now that they're assembled, good to go, 
we can put the rings on them. The piston rings have been fitted and the rings we've fitted are a lot different to the ones in the engine we pulled apart originally. Oil ring in particular, a lot less tension, hopefully a lot less friction and that little bit of extra power that we're looking for. Make sure when the rings are installed, they spin nicely in the piston. We don't want them to bind up or catch because the ring will break immediately. Also your ring end gap, work on fourth hour per inch of bore and about 80% of that for the second ring and you'll be somewhere near the money. We now have got them assembled. We can put some bearings in the bottom of them and we can check our rod bearing clearance. These have been all nicely refinished, nicely um, resized and that cross hatch is there to grab the bearing and stop that bearing spinning in the journal. These have dowels in them, um, inspect the dowels, make sure they're all in there and make sure they're not burnt over or, or pushed through the conrod. I'm gonna put some bearing shells in this now and we'll measure it up and see what sort of clearance we've got. With the conrod bearing installed, it's exactly the same method as we used earlier, using a smaller snap gauge to get that exact clearance and to make sure it's still round. We can only assume the machine shop's done a really good job, but it doesn't hurt to double check. So if I use that, then use my micrometer. I've already measured the crankshaft. And if I check that now, that gives me a fat tooth hour clearance, which is spot on for what we're after. Same, a lot of oil flow across the bearing. Keep it cool, keep that lubrication in there. A little bit loose for a road car, but this isn't a road car. I'm happy with that. I'm gonna check the other ones and then we can put them in the block. All the piston rings are fitted, all the rod bearings are installed. We've double checked the clearances and we know they're sweet. So it's now time to put the pistons into the block. The cylinder surface has to be absolutely spotless. And I've used a lot of cleaning techniques over the year and what I've found to be the best is automatic transmission fluid on a paper towel. Today we're using the KCK fully synthetic automatic transmission fluid because that's all we've got here. Automatic transmission fluid is high detergent and it will pull everything out of the cast iron sleeves. It will, will really clean them up. And like I said, if, if you think your bores are clean, grab some paper towel and some ATF, give it a go and prove me wrong. If you've got any, any better suggestions, I'd love to hear it, but that's what I've been using and that's probably the best thing I've found. Also use the ATF when lubricating the pistons in the piston ring compressor. It's just makes sense to me. Um, assembly lube on the bearings. We want these to be right. When you're knocking the pistons in, we don't want to punch them through into the crankshaft. We've, we've gone a lot of effort to get that crankshaft to the surface that we actually want. We don't need a dent in it from the Conrod hitting it. I've got the journal all the way down to give me the most room I can possibly get. You can get extenders, you can get bits of fuel line on, on studs and all sorts of stuff. Every time I do that, I lose them or somebody borrows them and never bring them back. So now I just do it by hand. I've got a, all my rings are phased where I want them. I've staggered the gaps. I've got them exactly where I, I want them. Arrows forward. I can sit that in there. Make sure the, the piston ring compressor is flush so the piston ring doesn't pop out the bottom when it, I'm bouncing the piston in. There's no surprises what that is. It's a hammer, but it's wrapped in a rag. Try to keep your tools clean. The amount of times I've seen somebody pull something apart that actually matters, and they've grabbed the socket that's still full of mud from when they fixed their mower the weekend before, and all of a sudden that's inside their engine or inside their gearbox. Keep your tools clean. If you can't, wrap it in a rag, and then everything will be cool. Make sure your arrow's forward. The conrod should be in the right location. Everything's straight down. So I can just now just bump that piston in. 
make sure there's no um, th there's no resistance. Otherwise, something's definitely wrong. That's a little bit firmer than I'd like. And if I look under there, I reckon one of the oil rings has popped out while I've been gas bagging. So I'll just pick that back up, just open that up a little bit, get that oil ring back in there. And this normally happens when the piston's bouncing, when, as you're tapping it in. If you drive it in in one clean go, generally it'll go straight in. Having these liners being fitted, it's a little bit sharper edge on the top than we would normally use. Not the end of the world, it's just, just something else we've got to keep an eye on. And that's popped out again. I might even have that gap in the wrong spot. My, uh, my piston and compressor might even be a little bit out of round, which might be hurting the process a bit. I'll just move that over there. Third time's a charm, kids. Let's, let's try again. No, I'm gonna grab another compressor and we'll, we'll try this again. It's just that oil ring's popping out and probably if that had a bigger chamfer on it, it would drop in, but we'll grab the right tool for the right job and we'll try that, we'll try that again. Sorry for the interruption and welcome back. I've just double checked. I haven't damaged those rings, which I haven't. I've got a round one of these that it's probably a little bit, um, a little bit different piston size than we'd normally use. So the, the, the standard piston we would use for that compressor has probably pushed it out around a little bit. I put that on by hand originally or first up just to make sure the rings are sitting in the groove. It is possible to catch the corner of the ring out it will break, it will ruin your day. And it's even more embarrassing than what just happened to me. Now that that's back in where we need it, we're gonna try, try again. Arrow pointing forward, everything should be orientated where it needs to be. Look at that, didn't that make a difference? So same, smooth in, you shouldn't have to hit it real hard. You're just, just overcoming the friction of the, um, of the piston rings. Now holding the bottom of the con rod to make sure it doesn't hit the crankshaft. Let's keep tapping that all the way in, all the way to the bottom. And that's home. Spin that over, we'll put the bearing cap on it. That way, instead of waiting to the end and putting all the caps on together, I, if I do them one at a time, I can't mix them up. I, I'm less likely to make a mistake. And also, we're getting it finished. We will do cylinders one and four while the crankshaft's all the way down, and then we'll come back, rotate it a little bit, and do the center two, uh, center two pistons. That's all, looks good. Last visual inspection, make sure I haven't missed anything. We'll just firm these down by hand. a little bit of weight on them. And even with that firmed up, you should still be able to move that con rod around. There's that little bit of clearance in there just to make sure everything's okay. I'll put the other pistons in and then we'll keep going. And all the pistons are in and all went in pretty well. I've just got to torque the caps up now. A lot like the mains, we use a little bit higher torque spec than um, the OEM would would put, you know, we have had these um, caps fret. And what I mean by that is the bolts stretch at high RPMs and the caps actually come loose. And you can see where the two caps have been chattering against each other. So by talking them up that little bit more, we take up that little bit of bolt stretch that we would have had otherwise, and we stop the bolts from stretching anymore. Um, and we stop the caps from fretting. This a lot like the mains, means you have to have them resized at the higher torque setting because it does pull them out of shape that little bit. With them torqued up, turn it over, make sure everything's smooth. What you can hear there is the piston rings on the cylinder wall, the, on the, the hone marks itself. 
That's what helps this engine run in. It'll get no chance to run in otherwise. It'll be straight out on the track and it'll be full throttle. So a little bit coarser than you'd use on a road car because we don't expect to do 200,000 kilometers on these rings. We do need them to bed in quite quickly, seal efficiently. And if it only has a, a two or 3,000 kilometer service life, well, that's no big deal. Now that that's done, I think we can put the cylinder head on. Just before we put the cylinder head on, I thought I'd show you how far these pistons come up the bores. And it's not quite flush, but it's not far off. But we've got a little bit of a safety cushion there. Should we need to service the block later on, we can still take a skim off it. If we, if we were on the edge, we'd have to throw the block away and start again. Not quite flush, but it's close. It gives us a good piston ahead clearance and a good piston to valve clearance. And it's certainly a good compromise. We have the proper cylinder head for this engine. This is one of our old race cylinder heads that we've had reconditioned essentially. So it's, other than it weighs a ton, it's cast iron. It's got the proper springs, the proper valves, and also the legal porting requirements, the, um, the correct throat size, the correct seats. It's the, the cylinder head that should be on a Formula Ford car, really. Valve springs, a little bit heavier than standard, nothing absolutely amazing. They sit in these little aluminium spaces to stop them jumping around too much. Other than that, the valve spring side's the same. It's uh, original retainers. The top of the valve stems have been machined for a positive valve stem seal, unlike the, the umbrella that they have from factory. Other than that, this thing is as standard as they get. This has got plenty of meat left on the surface. Uh, the one we pulled off had a whole lot of machining done. It was actually a mess. And the best part about this cylinder head is we have the matching intake manifold. This has already been port matched to suit that cylinder head. So we're in a good place. Simply now we can just drop this on the engine, bolt it up and it should be right. Just as we're talking the cylinder head down here, it's probably a good reminder that it's critical to, to tap and clean out all the threads in the block and the cylinder head. And as much as the job sucks, it's really important. If there'd been any uh, machining swarf or, or gum or garbage in the bottom of the bolt holes, it's likely the bolt would bottom out in the bottom of the hole before it actually clamped up on the cylinder head. And then all of a sudden, we've got a blown head gasket and we don't know why. Same goes for the con rods and the mains. It, it's just good housekeeping. That way you know when everything's torqued up, it's right. Um, and all the threads are nice. It's, it gives you good feedback. It's not the threads tight and then the torque or the crush is actually inaccurate because you're putting too much effort in just to pull the bolt around. But now that this cylinder head's on, torqued down, now we're getting close. The next thing to go in is the push rods and these are lovely and new compared to the grotty old ones that come out. The, uh, the, the condition of the ball, both ends is particularly important, where it goes into the lifter and where it goes into the rocker. Bit of assembly lube on each end, drop it in and you should be able to feel it push into the end of the lifter. I'll just get all of these in and then we can sit the, uh, the rocker gear on. Rocker gear is basically standard. Um, be a little bit careful. There's a, there's a gallery up the front that blows some air through it or something and make sure it's clean. Otherwise you will, um, you will certainly have issues. Push rods, out of all the push rods we got, most of them are bent. They, they do bend quite easily, especially with a few revs on board. So we've found the, the best of what we've got and uh, we've, we've essentially reconditioned them from there. That's the last push rod in. Just a little bit of assembly lube in the end of each ball. And then we'll put a little bit of assembly lube on the tip of each valve just to protect it on initial startup. Even though it's a baby cam with little springs, it's still quite a lot of load for steel on steel contact. So just 
just a little bit of insurance for that first fire up. We will have to set the valve clearances because it is a new combination. Um, we've got no idea where it's where it will be at, but let's find out. That sits on there. Make sure all the push rods line up with the adjuster balls. I think we've got a valve there on full lift, so we might rotate the engine just a little bit just to ease that up. I've adjusted all the um, all the adjusters right back as far as we possibly can, just to take the weight off it. Yeah, I think that's that's a little bit better. Gently tighten it down. Try to be even. We certainly we don't want to get to this point and then start doing damage. These have got Allen head bolts in them, just because they're a grade eight bolt. A little bit better, a uh, little bit better than the cap screws than the than the standard hex bolts. Almost there, just a little bit to go. In all the years we race these, we never actually had problems with the rocket gear. It was always bent push rods, always bent valves. Um, and just from piston to valve contact, they are relatively quite close for the small springs they have. Yeah, we've got a little bit of clearance on most of them. I'll just torque that down. Then we'll go through and we'll set the valve clearance. The torque on these is a little bit higher than factory once again. No machining needs to be done. It's just, just a safety thing. They pulled down quite nice. We might gently try to turn it over. I think the, the lash is somewhere near it. They all go up and down, so that's a good thing. I'll get out the feeler gauges now and we'll set the lash. With the valve lash on these, they're not particularly difficult to do. And the easiest way I find to do it is to get a valve on full lift and then you know the one next to it on that same cylinder has to be on the base circle. We're just gonna put an initial clearance in it because we need to set these hot. It's a little bit irrelevant what the clearance is when they're cold. It only matters when it's up to operating temperature. So I'm just going 10 thou, just so we've got a a little bit there to work with. The um, the adjuster screws are, are tied in the shaft. They don't have a locking nut as such. What I will do is grab a paint pen and just mark the ones that I've done just so I don't get too lost on where I'm at. I'll just finish this one off. And that's it there. And that's the last one done. I've just used my, my purple marker just to put a little mark on the adjusting nut of each one I've done, just so I don't lose where I'm at. Doing it with that method, you still get it done in two full rotations. It just, it's a little bit easier than trying to count cylinders and figure out where the piston's at. And now our intake manifold can go on. This is port matched to the head. It locates via some dowels. Um, and it's a really nice bit of gear. And like I was saying in some of the earlier videos, we would go through and buy 15 or 20 different castings to get the best cylinder head and the best intake manifold and the best block. And this, I'd, I'd say this intake manifold has maybe only done dyno time. It hasn't done very much work at all. It's had the top machined for clearance for the throttle shaft. So maybe we were playing with carburetor spacings um, and this just ended up in the parts bin. And while we're on this side of the engine, it only makes sense to put the distributor in. I know exactly where the camshaft's at because I can see the rockers. I can see the bottom of the engine so I know when it's on TDC. I wound it over to compression on number one. About 15 degrees before, it should be close enough to get it started. Distributor's got a new set of points in it. Um, a lot of assembly lube on the gear. It's actually a new cam gear as well. 
these oh, it has a new o-ring even that goes into the block so not a bad bit of gear they've only got to line up with the camshaft we're not trying to line up pump tangs and all that sort of stuff but if i can get that in the right spot i think i've missed it by a tooth if i can get that in the right spot i should be right i've i've marked on the distributor itself where number one post is And I think about there should be close enough to get it started. I'll put a bolt in that and lock it up. I also have the fitting here for the oil pressure gauge. The gallery is just full to the distributor there. And this is exactly why I don't use thread tape on fittings like this. I'll use liquid thread sealer, but not tape itself. If you wind it the wrong way, it will definitely come off and will definitely go into the gallery and will definitely cause a whole lot of damage. Thread sealer, I, I think, is the only way to go with things like this. It, it will not get into the oil gallery unless you're using way too much of it. And it's, it's just a, a neater end finish. And while we're fitting off some of these engine covers, it might be a good opportunity to talk about engine sealant and the right and wrong ways to go about it. And I'm really keen to hear what you guys think. But at no stage should engine sealant be on there that thick that it blocks holes or it can fall off and fall on the bottom of the engine. And by no means is roof and gutter sealant from your local hardware an engine sealant. This is the oil pump that come off this engine and this is the gasket and it's hemorrhaging with all different types of sealant but there's definitely uh, roof and gutter sealant on there because it falls apart with the, with, when it comes in contact with fuel or oil or, or really anything petroleum. Engine sealant has its place and has its purpose, but it shouldn't be lathered on absolutely everything. Um, like I said, I'm keen to hear what you guys think, but that some of these things, as we pulled it apart, there's bolts covered in sealant, um, the, the sealant in oil galleries, the sealant falling in the bottom of the engine, and this is just, just completely wrong. But I'm gonna go ahead now, fit this front cover. I've got new gasket, new front seals in, and we should be able to then put the fuel pump on and keep putting some of the extra stuff on before we get to the oil pump. And another thing I'd really like to hear everybody's opinion on, when I fit the oil seals, I'll lubricate the inside of the steel with like a petroleum jelly or a Vaseline. And I do this so it melts. I figure if I use the grease, it will remain in that seal forever and sort of give it a path to leak oil and may present problems. So I'd, I'd love to hear your experience. But now we are almost at that point where we need an oil pump. Hands up, who wants to see inside it? it it feels like it's got oil in it, but as we covered off on, on the last video when we pulled the engine apart, all the fittings are open, they're, they're broken, it's full of elastic, and, and we, we need to make sure it's okay. With the oil pump now stripped down, completely disassembled, we can, we can sort of see what we've got and it's not that bad. Full of sealant, which we, we kind of knew about and, and full of dirt, but the actual pump itself isn't that bad. It's still quite serviceable. The scavenge side, it's pumped some engine parts at some stage and we sort of knew that. We knew there was shrapnel in the dry sump tank. The only way it can get from the engine sump to the dry sump tank is through the scavenge side of the pump and it's made quite a mess of the gears. That's not, not, not the end of the world. A phone call and I've got another set of gears to go in it. 
We've had to grind the gears to get the the end clearances right, otherwise they bond in the housing. This has got a floating steel shim in the middle and it's, it's a little bit unique in its design that way. But we've got that, we've got a new set of O-rings. This pump can go back together. A Little bit of assembly lube on all the gears, just so they seal that little bit better on initial startup and they're not dry. It'll help pick the oil up out of the sump tank. It'll, um, it'll just really look after it. So now that it's all clean and laid out nice, Let's get into it, get this thing back together and we can fit it to the engine. The next part we're gonna fit on this engine needs to be the carburetor. And it's probably the single component I've been dreading the most. It's, um, it's wrapped in electrical tape. It's got a pop rivet in the side of it. These are a Weber 32, 36. They are what we need to run. And they, they were the factory carby on, on an Escort, say. So pretty cool bit of gear. A lot of the factory systems don't work so well in a race environment. And we've experimented a lot with carbies and tried a lot of different stuff, but really struggled with the transition between the main jet and the air correctional jets and getting that correct and um, fuel aeration in the fuel bowl or, or fuel surge and all these sorts of things trying to overcome that but there's no good talking about it we might as well get in we'll pull this thing apart we'll see what it looks like inside and what we need to do to get it ready to bolt onto this engine All I had to do was to pull the top cover off to know that this is actually the racing carburetor. It's had the modifications that we would normally do for these carbies on these engines in these cars. The factory power valve has been removed. Uh, the, the holes have been blocked up. It's got a bit of mesh in there to stop fuel surge into the, um, into the Venturis themselves. I'll keep pulling this apart. We'll, we're just gonna put a kit in it. It looks like the jets are pretty close. There's a lot of tape on it. I got most of the tape off, but it's just generally grotty and it's been sitting around. It hasn't had a whole heap of fuel sitting in it, so the, the varnish isn't too bad. So I'm actually quite happy that this should clean up pretty well. Just a few small things with the carby. It wasn't getting full throttle. Somebody's changed the throttle linkage. Fantastic, more power to them. But they've tightened it up that tight that the linkage had actually jammed up and was only getting about three quarter throttle. So we fixed that. Screw in fitting for the fuel line. If you wanna see how easy they fall out, have a look at this. Just a wiggle with the vice grips and it fell straight out. So screw in fitting, new fuel line, the carby's done. When I mentioned earlier about the power valves missing, it's this bit here. It doesn't work so well in, in this particular environment, so we delete it. And you can also sort of see in that shot how much we machine off the choke surface, off the air horn. We were given a minimum spec and we messed around a lot with that using different heights, um, velocity stacks, rounded edges, different air filters, all sorts of different stuff to get that to work really well. About the only thing left now is just a few covers. The cam cover, or I'm sorry, the rocker cover on this particular engine, it can go on. Distributor cap and leads, which is also a bit of a novelty for the young, for the younger folk out there. They probably don't know what it does. Um, we can sit that on. 
Interesting fact, we name all our engines. Every engine has its own personality and often the build itself will have its own personality, how it goes, what goes wrong. Um, and, and there's always a story behind it. So it became easier for us to identify an engine by name, we sort of remembered it. And with some of the cars we have that have multiple engines on rotations, it makes it really easy to, to know which engine's in the car and, and which one they need for a particular track. So this engine, we're gonna call it Spiro. For the people that know that should mean something, but I think that's a, a fitting name for the engine. But that's just about it, we're buttoned up. The engine, complete it, uh, engine, clutch, flywheel, everything is under 100 kilos. This engine, when it was originally manufactured, was 63 to 65 horsepower, I think they were. A good one, between 104 and 106 horsepower, and, and you've got a really competitive engine. And we've achieved that, well, hopefully we've, we've achieved that with stock components and the same components essentially that made that 65 horsepower. And assuming this all works the way we think it should, we're all champions, we're all winners. Thanks again for watching. Stay tuned, there'll be more episodes. There's heaps more of this car to put back together. The parts are starting to come back. The benches are starting to fill up with reconditioned components. And we can hopefully get into actually assembling the car and making it look like a car, like it once was. Thanks again, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. See you on the next video.